Good evening and welcome. What a lovely crowd. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Professor Golan Levin, and I'm director of the facility that you're in, which is the Frank Ratchi Studio for Creative Inquiry. This is the research laboratory of the College of Fine Arts, and it's your research lab for atypical, anti-disciplinary, and inter-institutional research and outreach at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture. Um, we are thrilled to welcome you here uh, this uh, Tuesday evening. Um, for a presentation uh, by Rob Rogers, who is a political cartoonist. Spoiler alert, um, he has uh, encountered some controversy, and um, we're, we're really looking forward to hearing from him tonight. <clears throat> um, this is the final and, and last uh, uh, episode of the Steiner Lecture Series in Creative Inquiry for the fall 2018 season. Uh, and uh, please stay tuned or subscribe to our newsletter for announcements about our wonderful upcoming lectures starting uh, in spring of 2019. We've got a lot of great lectures on deck. Um, so I'm going to, uh, to introduce Rob Rogers. I'm going to hand it off to Tim Haggerty, who's the director of the Humanities Scholars Program here at Carnegie Mellon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, checking my notes, my name is indeed Tim Haggerty, and I direct the Humanities Scholars Program at Carnegie Mellon. Today's talk with Rob Rogers is sponsored by the Humanities Center, the Frank Ratchi, uh, Ratchi Studio for Creative Inquiry, and the School of Art. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation tonight. For most of you, Rog, Rob Rogers doesn't need much of an introduction. After receiving his MFA from Carnegie Mellon, Rob took an internship with the now defunct Pittsburgh Press and was then hired by the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette in 1993. For the next 25 years, which is a bit daunting for those of us who remember all 25 of them, <laughs> he provided editorial cartoons for the Post-Gazette and soon built a reputation as one of America's leading editorial cartoonists. Along with his cartoons that commented upon national politics, which were soon syndicated and were reproduced across the country, Rogers wrote and drew Brood on Grant, a local strip that explored the ever colorful machinations of Pittsburgh politics. And along the way, by the way, he picked up quite a few awards including a number of Golden Quill Awards, which are given by the Press Club of Western Pennsylvania, the Thomas Nast Award given by the Overseas Press Club. By the way, anybody who does, studies American cartoons genuflex every time the two words Thomas Nast are said. Um, and, and in 1999, he was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. In 2018, he was fired from the Post-Gazette. Rogers' cartoons appear in a number of collections that deserve a place on your bookshelves, including No Cartoon Left Behind, Mayoral Inc., Cartooning Pittsburgh's Mayors, a book, I imagine, that pretty much wrote itself, and the forthcoming Enemy of the People, which is scheduled for a December release, which, interestingly, was a tidbit noted by The Hollywood Reporter. Not that I would begin a rumor or anything. Tonight, Rob will talk about his eventful career, and then um, we will begin a discussion for the next half hour or so. Please feel free to join in. But most of all, please feel free to welcome CMU alumni Rob Rogers. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Golan. And thank you to all of you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, Yes, I am now more famous for being fired than I was for working. Uh, <laughs> I hope it doesn't happen to you. But um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, I'm going to get right into it here, and then we'll have time for questions later. But um, I was recently fired, um, and upon being fired, as as every cartoonist who's ever been fired probably did. I decided to draw a cartoon about it. <laughs> so, uh, so my friend Matt Bores over at thenib.com called me up and said, hey, will you, will, would you write about this and, and draw something for us? And I said, sure, why not? <laughs> Got nothing else to do. Uh, so, so this is the cartoon that, that came out of that uh, conversation. Donald Trump cost me my job. You're fired. Okay, he didn't actually say that, but to me, uh, he might as well have. 
After 25 years as the political cartoonist for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, I was fired in June for being too critical of the president. We're going to need your badge and your pen. I started my career at the Pittsburgh Press in 84 when Reagan was running for his second term. And there you see the, the Grecian formula they used for the ink. India ink was good, but Grecian formula is even better. Uh, early on, I was still learning how to be a daily cartoonist. This is my old editor at the press, uh, Angus McCarran. Uh, I showed my editorial, uh, my editor several sketches a day. These suck. A six-year-old could do better. After my second year, when it was clear that I had learned to be my own best editor, I was given total freedom. These suck. A six-year-old could do better. That's when I had hair. Uh, uh, when, when the PG uh, absorbed the press in 1993, I became the second liberal cartoonist at the paper. This was unheard of uh, in a time when papers were shedding cartoonists. And uh, he's saying, you each get an office, a full, a full salary in an office. And I say, is this one of those hidden camera pranks? I worked well with my editors, always engaging in a healthy give and take. Like most cartoonists, I had two or three cartoons killed a year. Uh, sorry, you can't draw the Pope shitting in the woods for a family newspaper. I tried, but uh, the PG has always been a left-leaning paper. The publisher, John Robinson Block, or JR, mostly kept his politics to himself. Um, at least, you know, in terms of me, uh, he, my, my editors have told me, no, he didn't. <laughs> but, um, and John is here in the back. Uh, John Allison uh, is my last editorial page editor who also got out, uh, fairly unscathed, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, in 2015, that began to change. Suddenly, JR was enamored with candidate Trump and started hinting about a possible endorsement. What about the moral stands we've taken for decades? Ah, eh, what do we know? JR began to push back on my cartoons about the Donald. Tell Rogers his cartoons don't capture Trump's intoxicating masculinity. <clears throat> my editorial page editor, who championed and defended me uh, to management, took a buyout in 2016 rather than endorse Donald Trump. That was Tom Wazaleski. Um, then in January 2018, Keith Burris from our sister paper in Toledo penned what many called a racist defense of Trump's shithole comments. And here I was just reading it for the Steelers coverage. Uh, rather than retreat in shame, J.R. doubled down by promoting Burris to editorial director over both papers. The author of Reason as Racism was now my boss. Dead cartoonist drawing. I began to envision the two of them as master blaster from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Several cartoon ideas enter, no cartoon ideas leave. Uh, for those of you who remember the movie, but uh, <laughs> I would email my idea to J.R. and Keith in the morning, often being forced to rework ideas on deadline. No, no, God, no. That's actually an email that, that I got from him. <laughs> that I, I'm not making it up. <laughs> uh, with Burris, I felt more bullied than managed. He called my ideas too malicious and would lecture me on what made good satire. Consider the brilliant pro-slavery cartoons of the 1850s. Now that's some satire. My bosses said my cartoons were not funny. Maybe they weren't laughing because they were seeing their own beliefs laid bare on the editorial page. Ambien is funny, but why trash the KKK? In the three months Burris was my editor, 19 of my cartoons or ideas were killed. The last six were in a row. A social media protest began to build. Where are the torch and pitchfork emojis? It was clear from the working guidelines contract they asked me to sign that they were not interested in working it out. I can't work like this. 10 days later, they offered me an equally insulting severance, uh, or t 10 days later, did I say that? Uh, they offered me an equally insulting severance agreement that demanded rights to all my cartoons. My labor lawyer was stunned. This is a true story. Uh, he, he did say this. I, I, I've fought mining companies that kill people, and these are the worst labor contracts I've ever seen. Uh, so you probably figured out from reading this that I did not sign the onerous non-disparagement agreement. Damn, he didn't sign it. <laughs> uh, that, that's what political cartoonists do. We disparage those in power, especially those who abuse that power. Forget baby prisons. We need those cages for the cartoonists. Now I'm unemployed, but on the bright side, there's no one left to reject my cartoons. You suck. Damn snowflake. Burn in hell. Terrible cartoons. Where'd you learn to draw? I still get all of that, you know, but... Um, so that was that was my f response to what happened to me. Um, and we can talk more about that after afterwards. But um, 
uh, I'll go through some of the cartoons here and, and talk to you. But first, I thought I'd discuss ideas. And people always ask me, you know, one of the questions that I get asked the most is, where do you come up with your ideas? Or how do you come up with your ideas? And this is how, uh, right here. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's why I got fired. No, that's actual, actually Michael Phelps. But, um, <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes I don't have to dig that hard for an idea. Uh, most days I do, and I read several papers and, and watch the news. But, but there was one day um, that I saw this image of Netanyahu uh, in front of the UN. And he was he was talking about Iran and the bomb that they had. And he had this bomb drawing. And I thought, oh my God, he stole that from Warner Brothers, you know. And so so I did this cartoon and it's got, you know, <laughs> Ahmadinejad saying, OK, who leaked our nuclear bomb design to Netanyahu? And there, of course, is Wiley Coyote looking very guilty there. Uh, other times, it's just a story about something that I can't resist. Uh, here's Dick Cheney refusing to call uh, the CIA's brutal interrogation torture. And that was when the torture report came out. And so I drew Dick Cheney <laughs> as the Statue of Liberty, with his torture handbook. And he's saying, bring us your huddled masses yearning to be waterboarded. But a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll, I'll sit down and I'll, and I'll write down ideas in my sketchbook. Um, and, you know, here, here, this is hard to read, but it says, uh, this was back in 2004, it's an old one, but it says Groundhog's Day, um, uh, WMD intelligence, uh, Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction, and then uh, gay marriage in Massachusetts. So I ended up combining two of the topics, um, the first two, and created this sketch and then this cartoon. And it was uh, Groundhog's Day and WMDs, and it says... I was wrong about him having weapons of mass destruction, but he was still a threat. And there's, and this was had a nice Pennsylvania twist to it too, because uh, punks a Tony Phil. Um, but so, so this is kind of my process. I, I think of what a good metaphor would be. I, I come up with an idea, but then I still had to get it past the editor, um, and that was sometimes a problem. Um, here, here's a, an illustration of why that is a problem because there, our brains are very different. Um, here's a cartoonist brain. The largest thing on, on his, his or her mind is uh, toilet humor. And then uh, things like winning a Pulitzer, keeping his or her job, and that tiny, tiny little part of the cartoonist brain that is taste. <laughs> and then here's the editor's brain. A lot more things on his or her mind. And uh, he's thinking about not offending readers, keeping the publisher happy, also winning a Pulitzer, uh, kissing up to advertisers, the bottom line and that tiny, tiny little part of the editor's brain that is sense of humor. <laughs> so you can see they're very different and, and oftentimes they don't mesh. Uh, so, but so for years I would submit an idea. Now I don't, but, uh, but for years I would submit an idea to the editors in the morning and it would usually get approved and then I would move on. Um, but, but occasionally they would cause some problems and, and occasionally they would be killed. Usually two or three a year would be killed. And oftentimes in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's a very Catholic city. So whenever there was something involving a, a scandal at the Catholic Church with, you know, whether it's the pedophile scandals or, or what, um, I, I would draw something and it would often get a lot of mail. So this is one that I drew when the Pope visited with Castro. And, uh, and he says, you're an aging leader of a beleaguered belief system who tolerates no dissent. What do you want from me? And Castro said, uh, pointers. <laughs> So you can imagine this got me this got me uh, really uh, a lot of mail and, and hate mail and phone calls and um, and even ended up, I think, um, getting me in trouble with the Vatican, the Vatican newsletter. I, there was something in there. Uh, but this cartoon actually did run. So uh, that's why. it. Uh, now, this one did not run. And here's this was <laughs> this was. <laughs> 1993, this was, I think, the Cincinnati pedophile scandal was happening or something in Ohio. And, um, and they, ran, they had it in the, on the page, and then it, it later got pulled. The next day, I get this call, uh, or maybe two days later, from, um, from one of my syndicated clients who said, you know, they're down in Florida, and they said, oh, man, we ran that cartoon. We were getting all kinds of hate mail and calls. He said, what kind of reaction are you getting? And I'm like, well... <laughs> nothing <laughs> and then he i told him what happened i said they killed it and he said cowards <laughs> uh this one never made it out of the sketch stage this was uh, back when the i think the boston pedophile scandal was happening and here you have osama bin laden and he's saying i heard this was a good place for evildoers to hide 
Yeah, so that, that obviously didn't make it. Uh, <laughs> this one was supposed to run on Good Friday, and, um, and this was the, the Irish scandal, I believe, and uh, Benedict was sort of avoiding the topic while he was giving his Easter Mass. So I, I showed this. It's the hiding, annual hiding of the pedophile priests, and if you, if you see the little eggs, they all have... Uh, priest collars. Uh, so anyway, they killed it, but it, but it had already gone out for syndication. So a week later, it, it ended up as the top cartoon in USA Today. So I was excited about that. Um, now, this one, uh, the, the next two are cartoons that I tried to do when Benedict announced he was retiring. And um, I just figured what, you know, this image of him leaving the Vatican with a box in his hand full of all of his stuff, you know. So I came up with this and he's carrying a book that says how to hide a pedophile. The pill stops here and uh, a mug that says the devil made you gay. And then he's thinking keeping the church in the dark ages is a job for a much younger man. Well, the publisher was traveling at the time overseas. And so he was calling in. And so I had this almost finished and he called in and he killed it. And so then, uh, then I thought, okay, well, I got to do something. This is historic, the Pope retiring. So I drew this one, and it's the, you know, the Pope retires, no, you know, no gays, contraception-free zone, you know, hey, you progressive Catholics, stay off my lawn. And, you know, I just thought, that's what he's going to do now. Uh, again, a couple hours later, he called. I was almost done, finished with the cartoon, and he killed it. So I ended up switching topics, and I drew this one. Uh, he has his father's eyes, and there you go. So sometimes, the, you know, in the midst of all of this, sometimes you just have to switch topics. Uh, I, I, I have gotten cartoons about the Pope, and this one was when, uh, when uh, Benedict started the uh, Twitter account. And this is the actual Twitter account, and it says, uh, OMG, this 21st century technology is great for spreading my 15th century views on gays, women, and contraception, LOL. And then my favorite part, hashtag say 10 Hail Marys. Uh, this cartoon they actually printed too. And this has uh, Muhammad in the cartoon. Muhammad, Buddha, and Jesus walk into a bar. Uh, why do they keep killing in my name? I never sanctioned ethnic cleansing in Burma. And try explaining the Crusades and the Inquisition. So, you know, this and this was, you know, during that time, it was right after the Charlie Hebdo stuff. So, um, so it was controversial, but but it did get in, and, and really, you know, because of the way I positioned it, it didn't get as much uh, negative reaction. Uh, this is just one that I liked. It was about the environment and and uh, the Pope driving the the new Pope driving around in his Kia Soul, and here he is. My other Pope mobile is a bicycle, Vatican tree hugger on board. Go green or go Protestant. <laughs> the road to hell is paved with carbon. And finally, re reduce, reuse, recycle, repent. <laughs> so, so there have been controversial cartoons in the past. Um, I have had a few killed, but it's, like I said, never more than one or two a year. And, of course, the readers are never shy. You know, they always tell me what they think. And here's, here's some examples. Um, this was a letter I got, and it was just, it was, it was one of my cartoons folded up into an envelope, and I didn't realize it until I opened it, what it was. Here's, uh, it says, Rob Rogers says, and then, of course, he <laughs> smeared it in, in, you know, feces. But, of course, I, I took a closer look, and I was relieved to see the piece of grass. Uh, so that made me think, okay, well, it's not human, unless this guy's, you know, taking a dump in his yard. But um, anyway, this was the cartoon. I didn't think it was actually my worst, you know, like my most controversial cartoon. This is when Obama uh, decided that same-sex marriage was, um, was okay. And so... This cartoon, uh, this was at the 60th anniversary of Hiroshima. This one got me more letters and phone calls than any other uh, cartoon I've ever done. And I actually spent the entire weekend calling people back because, uh, because there were a lot of veterans who took it the wrong way. And, and this was post 9-11. And so I just had the little kid saying, which terrorist group did that? And, um, and so you can imagine, you know, the, the people whose families have, were in the war and, you know, who said, you know, my father flew... In World War II, he's not a terrorist, you know, and so, so I did spend the, you know, the weekend calling people back and just explaining that, you know, and this is one of the letters, um, just explaining that I, I, you know, I support the troops and I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying anything negative about them. I'm just saying, in reflecting on this, maybe this is something we wouldn't do again, you know, especially after 9-11. Um, 
So the process, let's talk a little bit about how I come up with these cartoons and, and what it takes to draw them. Uh, you know, things have changed now that, that people are using different technology to, to, to work on cartoons. I still like to draw mine with, with pen and ink, and, and then I scan it in, and I do the, the coloring on the computer. Um, this is a piece that I did for an exhibit that we had at the Toonsium back in 2016 about campaign cartoons. So I said, uh, let me draw you a picture. Step one, find a topic that begs for satire. GOP candidates compare penis size. Hello. Uh, step two, choose the perfect metaphor. Well, I can't draw genitals in a family newspaper, but hands are okay. Things with small hands, baby, watch, T-Rex. Step three, create a rough sketch using your favorite sketching tool. And this was my, this was actually the sketch in my sketchbook, um, although I added a little bit to, to just for the example here. Uh, some cartoonists sketch with a pen, some use a pencil, and some use a tablet. <laughs> uh, step four, transfer the sketch using a light table or some other form of black magic. I still use a light table. Uh, step five, ink the cartoon using your favorite inking tool. Step six, add the color by hand. I still have my easel from when I was in CMU, you know. <laughs> uh, or digitally, why isn't this working? I'm not, I'm not that adept, but I can use Photoshop, so. Uh, and then step seven, stand back and watch as readers react to your brilliance. I don't get it, give it a sec. I still don't get it, give it another sec. I don't have all day. And then there's the, the, the finished cartoon down there, I'll show that to you in a more detail in a, in a second. So. Um, that show that we did at the Toonsium was about the campaign. And, um, and there were a lot of, I, I got cartoons from all over the country from different cartoonists and there were a lot of Trump cartoons. Here's the one I just showed you, this is it. Uh, my small hands don't seem to be slowing me down. Uh, here's one I did about um, Ted Cruz when he was getting into the, into the race. Uh, most people just throw their hat in the ring, Senator Cruz. And here's one about the Bush dynasty. Uh, we just lost the patriarch. Uh, this is Jeb and W and J G H W. And Jeb is trying to be his own guy. He says, read my lips. I am my own man. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Bernie and Goliath. Uh, I'm here to take back our democracy from billion millionaires and billionaires. How cute. And then Game of Thrones 2016, here's Hillary saying, this isn't a coronation. I want my minions to see me as a candidate of the people. You could start by not calling them minions. I did, you know, I did a lot of cartoons about the, the Clintons, obviously. Um, so, um, you know, equal opportunity. Uh, the many faces of Bernie Sanders. Here he's angry at Wall Street, sad about the prison system, disappointed with Obama, surprised by grassroots support, giddy over free college, <laughs> ecstatic about New Hampshire. Woo! And then Trump, of course, made, you know, mincemeat of everybody in the race on the Republican side, so I did, I had the Trump butcher shop, Ground Carson, Lion Ted T-Bone, Jeb Baloney, Christy Prime Rib, Fiorina Flank, Rubio Ribeye, and here he's saying, let the healing begin. <laughs> this is after he, he had clearly uh, uh, clinched it. Um, <clears throat> here's the 2016 Trump Olympics. Sometimes when there's something else going on, like the Olympics, it's kind of a nice metaphor. I can, I can get a lot of mileage out of it. Um, here he is, leadership high jump. He went under, we'll have to lower the bar again. Uh, name calling marathon, crooked Hillary, Hillary Rotten Clinton, the devil, creator of ISIS, foreign policy diving, cannonball, and civility shot put. You won't believe how far I can toss this crying baby. This was the debate when he was hovering over Hillary all the time and he was sort of walking around behind her. And, you know, and so this couple's watching and the woman says, Hillary didn't end war or cure cancer. She clearly lost. And the guy says, Trump didn't grope her on stage. He won. This was sort of the, the debate of low expectations, the third debate when, when, you know, all they really, all Trump really had to do was not, you know, implode on stage. Uh, the presidents. The reason I, I wanted to include some of these old cartoons here is just to, to show that I have covered every president and, you know, maybe maybe not with the same fervor that I've covered Trump, but uh, but certainly with with plenty of fervor. Um, 
here's here's the, the you can see my style has changed a lot these are some old ones uh this was from 84 the year i began um he has agreed to meet with you but he won't wear the costume <laughs> And then remember, I don't know if you remember the, the, the time that he tried to tell a joke and it went badly because the mic was on. Testing, one, two, three. Did you hear the one about? And then, of course, his scandal was the Iran-Contra scandal. Here's uh, the Ayatollah saying, American hostages, don't leave home without them. And here's uh, George H.W. Bush. He chose Dan Quayle as his running mate. And uh, there was a time when he got very sick and everybody was worried about him. Uh, Bush and and so everyone of course the one thing that everybody thought was oh no <laughs> guess who's next in line uh, here's George Bush on taxes going back on his his promise uh, he, he, he was uh, an anti quota person he didn't believe in affirmative action so he's like oh how cute he's dressed up like an anti quota demonstrator the Clintons uh, Bill, there's a, another bimbo at the door. What did you yabba dabba do this time? Uh, the Clintstones. Meet the Clintstones. <laughs> uh, did I mention the economy is doing great? <laughs> Frankly, I'm disgusted by all of you. Want to stay and watch? Absolutely. There's uh, Ken Starr and the media in there with, with uh, Monica and Bill. And then here's, you know, all of the allegations coming out at once. Et to Jennifer, et to Paula, et to Dolly, et to Elizabeth, et to Kathleen, et to Monica. And then, is it possible to just impeach him from the waist down? <laughs> uh, here's, uh, here's a cartoon that I put together from old cartoons. Uh, this was the evolution of the ears, and this is how my drawing of George W. Bush changed over the years. Here's uh, 99, and then 2000. And that as, his, as his policies became more and more absurd, uh, he, I, I started to draw him more absurd. And this is kind of how, how he ended up. Uh, you no longer have to live under the iron-fisted regime of the evil Saddam. We're here to liberate you. Here's Nixon and Watergate. Mistakes were made. Reagan, Iran-Contra, mistakes were made. George W. Bush, mission accomplished. And I was watching the Winter Olympics, and uh, and there was a there was snowboarding on, and and so of course I thought of Dick Cheney watching at the same time, and he was thinking, oh, snowboarding, right? I know what that looks like. It's like frozen waterboarding. <clears throat> uh, this was uh, Obama after the uh, in 2010. He says, uh, I had a hard time communicating my message. What did he say? He said he's a hardline communist messiah. <laughs> uh, this was after he got bin Laden, and I have him reading the proclamation saying, he's not only merely dead, he's really most sincerely dead. And then down on the corner there, there's a birther who's saying, I'm going to need to see a death certificate. And then finally, of course, uh, this is a recent one, the passing of the torch. And there we go. Which leads us to, of course, Trump. And so I'm going to show you a few Trump cartoons and then talk about the ones that were killed. Um, no more peddlers. This was his opening uh, press conference. He said, no more peddlers of fake news at my press conferences. And of course, he is the, the, the birther peddler of birtherism. Uh, Russian chess pieces. You got king, queen, bishop, knight, rook, and pawn. This is the biggest witch hunt in history. Surrender, Comey. Why can't they leave me alone? That was, of course, before he fired Comey. Uh, this, is not a, uh, this is when Flynn resigned. This is not about the Russians. It's about the leaks. And, and Trump was incredibly upset. He didn't care about what they were accusing Flynn of. He just cared about the leaks in the White House. This is just one about his Twitter. And he's sitting on a, a branch labeled credi credibility. And that still holds true. Uh, this was when Bannon and, and Jared were, were at each other, and there was sort of this war going on in the White House, and Bannon saying, hey, you're supposed to dance with the white nationalist who brought you. And just ignore him, Jared. And then he did fire Comey, and I drew this cartoon. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And you would be... <laughs> 
And of course, we, he's been talking about that wall. See, I told you I'd build a wall. And of course, we all know that uh, he doesn't believe in science. So here's El Nino, and uh, he's, he's blowing the science away, the climate report and everything else. Uh, one of the things that really got me upset in that first year was this, this Charlottesville. I drew this one afterwards because he was basically, you know, comforting uh, the racists. Um, then there was all these statues that were coming down, and this one is the GOP support for Trump. I can't believe this thing's still standing. This was a cartoon, that, no words. I just drew this after uh, the hurricane hit Houston, and while, while people were dealing with that hurricane aftermath, uh, Trump was, uh, was pardoning Arpaio. And so uh, there, was an, there was an image that I think the Houston paper did where they showed somebody being carried through the water. So I just kind of used that image. This is Puerto Rico. And of course, Trump was golfing during that one. So I drew this cartoon. Uh, this was when Trump opened up the, um, the Oswald, uh, the JFK files. Uh, look what I found in the JFK assassination file. Uh, Oswald didn't act alone. This is totally real and not drawn by me. And then, of course, he's got Hillary and Obama <laughs> on the grassy knoll. You're an unhinged, childish, nuclear despot with insane hair. I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> so there's a few examples of stuff that I drew that actually uh, got in the paper. Um, and then we're, now we're at the killed cartoons. So what happened was I had gotten some pushback from Oh, by the way, the image you keep seeing, these are the six in a row that were killed. We'll get to those in a second. Um, but, you know, as of March, when Keith Burris was hired to sort of crack down on me and, and to change the page, I mean, that was what he was there for. Um, you know, up to that point, like I said, I would have a, an average of uh, one or two cartoons killed a year. And he came in, and in that three months, I, I originally said 19, but I realized one of those uh, was not killed uh, he just didn't like it, and I ended up doing something else that wasn't actually killed, so I changed it to 18. Um, and these are, the, these are the 18 cartoons I'm going to show you now. Um, the first one was right, he started March 1st, I think, maybe. And so this was the first week. Um, uh, Trump had his steel tariffs, and I drew this. I thought, you know, him going to, you know, this trade war, him going to war was funny because he had, you know, uh, bone spurs and he couldn't go to war but I thought oh well what if he was you know in you know apocalypse now so he says I love the smell of napalm in the morning uh, sir that's the White House burning and this was because everybody you know there was all this turmoil in the White House at the same time people were leaving uh, the next cartoon so that one was killed in in the in the sketch stage I did do another one on the tariffs that that did get in um, this was about Sacone the local the local guy here that was running and um, and, uh, and against Connor Lamb. And, and so I, he kept saying he was Trumpier than Trump. And so I, I put all these asterisks down below and, and they really just hated it. It's, it says, not including the serial lies, chaos, hate-filled tweets, xenophobia, misogyny, Putin bromance, indicting friends, and porn star hush fund. Uh, and I, I prefer candidates with fewer disclaimers. They thought it went too far, so they killed it. Um, this one was about Stormy Daniels, and I thought this was a very polite way to, to talk about a porn star, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and the president. And, you know, it's, it's just him saying, I've never seen that cloud before in my life, but, if it, it, but, if it, but it better not break our non-precipitation agreement. Um, and that's what he was saying. He was saying, I don't know anything about her, but, you know, but he had this non, non-disclosure agreement with her. Um, anyway, so he killed this cartoon. A, a few days, like a, a couple of weeks later, Stormy Daniels is coming to Pittsburgh to do a show, like in a signing at one of the strip clubs. And there's all this media attention around it. And, and so, so I'm talking to Burris one day about what I'm going to draw. And he says, well, hey, you know, maybe you should do something on this Stormy Daniels thing. This is crazy, huh? And I said, and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's funny. And then he said, no, really? And I said, are you kidding? I said, you remember you killed this one, right? And he said, no, I don't remember that. And then I was just like, so I showed it to him and he's like, oh, and, you know, like he was like, oh, that's not bad. You know, we should have run it. <laughs> but I think that was part of the problem was he was he was he was looking, he was seeing that it was Trump and he was saying no. You know, he was just saying no. 
This one, I, I really have, I still haven't figured out why they killed this, but something about Trump saying, talking about the deep state. But this is when the bombs were going off in Austin and the FBI was down there and and saving people. And, and there's a woman saying, you're surprisingly brave for a crooked henchman of the deep state. And of course, that was Trump's whole line of, you know, uh, talk. So I guess they didn't like that. Uh, this is one that was only in sketch stage, but that was killed. This was when he was threatening to crack down on, on the Postal Service for, for giving Amazon a better deal or something, you know, even though they weren't. Uh, so neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stay these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Rabid dogs are another story. Uh, maybe if I hadn't made it a rabid dog, he would have said okay. But uh, this one I kind of knew wouldn't get in. <laughs> this is uh, Scott Pruitt, the environmental guy, and he's like, uh, this is Assad saying, hi, Scott, uh, want me to show you a quicker way to gas your people? Because he was, you know, deregulating all the pollution uh, standards. That one didn't get in. This one, I, I still think is good. The, the president's overall health is excellent, terrific stamina and great genes. I've never seen a more perfect human specimen. New White House doctor? No, Devin Nunez. You know, I don't know why this one didn't get in. It seems kind of harmless, but um, I think, again, it was, may have just been the quote of that week or something. Here's another one that got killed. All the king's fixtures and all the king's men are either fired, indicted, or on their way to the pen. Fake news. This one was when Trump was, uh, was tweeting at the one-year anniversary of the Mueller investigation, calling it the biggest witch hunt in American history. But I have him saying, what a world, what a world, as he's melting from the Mueller investigation. And, you know, again, they just killed it. Um, don't know why. Uh, this one was when uh, Gina Haspel was being um, sworn in as CIA director, and I have Trump saying, congratulations, Gina. How soon can we start waterboarding the FBI? And this was because she was controversial because of her torture. Um, and, and, you know, it was funny. I don't know why they didn't run that one. So then I drew this one just, just to kind of see if they would go for it, and they said no. Uh, you know, Trump with all of his lies. Okay, so now we now we were at the the um, the week the week when things sort of started to happen. So, what happened here was, um, I I was going to a convention in D.C. I mean in Philadelphia for a National Cartoonist Society, and so let me get to this cartoon first. This one's the one that I drew before I left, and I I thought they they would hold it for Memorial Day, um, but I was also thinking maybe they'll run it Friday. Um, he hated it. So by the time I, I was like halfway to Philadelphia, I got word that, no, this one was not going to go in. So I get to the hotel and I'm like, all right. So I draw uh, the NFL story just broke about how they're going to now force the, this, uh, the players to stand during the national anthem. So I, I wrote I wrote this cartoon and, and got it out really fast that night so that it could replace the other one. Well, they killed this one. And I was like, I don't know why, you know, except for the last panel that says, you know, prompted unnecessary rough tweets from Trump. There's really nothing bad about this one in terms of Trump. So I was confused. But anyway, so I get back from the convention and I draw another one. This one about the Starbucks. The guy got arrested in Starbucks and they and they decided to close for a day to do racial sensitivity training. And I was just saying, well, they didn't do that. At, at, you know, the NFL again killed. No explanation. Nothing. The next morning, um, people are starting to notice at this point on my Facebook that, you know, the cartoons on Facebook aren't in the paper and they're sort of s starting to talk. Uh, the next morning, Roseanne gets fired and I draw, uh, this is the sketch that I did. It says, despite the racist tweets, this sitcom does give an honest look at divided America. It's not a sitcom, honey. And it's Trump tweeting, you know. Um, so they, they killed that. And then I, and then I was really getting upset because I didn't know what was going on and, um, but 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 I was watching the news and, and the story about Roseanne blaming it on Ambien came up and I thought, oh, well, there's there's a topic. I'll draw this. And so I drew this one. It did get approved. Uh, you know, it's just a KKK guy saying, could it be Ambien uh, to the doctor? It was funny. It was sort of addressing the issue in a, in a different way. Um, and it did get in. It got on the page. And I was like, OK, phew, that that, you know, um, standoff is over and now we can get back to working again well i got a i get a call from mr allison later that night saying uh, uh john block killed it he 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 came in and said we're going to use the uh, toledo cartoon on that same subject um so 
The next day I woke up and I was pretty, pretty upset about it. Uh, I wrote a long letter to the publisher. It took me most of the day, you know, and just asked what was going on. I tried to, you know, I was very polite, but I was firm just saying, Hey, you know, I've never been treated like this before. What's, what's happening. I was not getting any explanation. Then I realized, you know, the day's half over and I hadn't drawn anything yet. And I thought, Oh man, I don't want them to think I'm not going to draw. So I drew this thing really fast and it ended up being the cartoon that got, got the most publicity of anything I did that week. Um, ended up being used in, in all kinds of places. Um, and then Sunday, I, I, for the Sunday, I drew this one. And so they were both killed. No explanation. Um, but at that point, I had stopped sending the idea even. I, you know, I just figured they're killing everything. Um, and we can get into more details about sort of how that all played out uh, later that week. But then I, I decided to take vacation time while we worked things out or didn't. <laughs> um, but that, that, here's just a couple of little headlines. Uh, WASA was the first one to sort of pick up the, uh, the story about the cartoons not running. Um, and here's Bill Peduto early on saying, you know, he takes digs at me, he makes fun of my weight and chins. He's critical when, <laughs> when he believes I can do better. But then he supported me and he said, you know, um, and he said that, that the paper was wrong. So then after, after all those six were killed and, and I, I had actually found out what they were proposing in this contract, uh, which was, was not good, I, that's when I decided to break my silence and, and go, on, go on the news. So uh, I went on Jake Tapper and he's a, uh, he's a cartoonist himself. If you've seen his Sunday show, you know that. Um, so I thought he would be a good one to talk to. And, uh, here's a, here's a tweet from Barbara Streisand, <laughs> you know, she picked up the story when it was in the Philadelphia paper, um, which was nice, uh, Columbia journalism review. Then when I did finally get fired, I went back on CNN with, uh, with, um, Aaron Burnett. And then the, the, the next day, um, even before the nib called the New York times called and said, would you, would you draw something for us? And so I did, I did a story for the Sunday New York Times, which was, and, you know, quite nice. Uh, here's a story from Politico where, where the editor calls me too angry. Uh, but then here's just some examples of, like, this is a, a, a San Diego protest about the immigration policy where they, where they blew up the cartoon and, and started using it. You can see a couple of images uh, in the back there. Uh, HBO Vice uh, news did a, did a story about me and, uh, that's what this one is. So the question everybody asked me is what now, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, I did a, I did a long form comic for the new book, which I'm sorry is not here yet. The printer there, there's been a, a hold up with the printer. I'm sorry about that, but, um, I do have my old books here <laughs> if you're interested. Um, but what now that's, that's the question everyone asks me. What now you mean besides weeping and, and bouts of despair? Uh, it's not like I can just switch careers. Uh, I can remove your appendix for half price. I've been cartooning since I was a baby. I remember being yelled at for decorating the wall of our apartment. No, editors. I copied comics out of the paper. I was really good at drawing peanuts. What does cease and desist mean? It's a note from Charles Schultz. I actually did get a letter like this when, uh, uh, but it was from the syndicate and it was sort of they had to they had to send everybody one. But but Charles Schultz actually liked it when you used his characters and, and he collected the cartoons. Uh, when I was 10, my dad asked me to draw his caricature for one of his work presentations. Why do I look like tricky Dick Nixon? I draw him like I see him. By the time I got to college, my path was clear. We'll pay you to draw editorial cartoons for the college paper. Call the nurse. I think he just fainted. Uh, I spent the next three decades perfecting my craft. Beats getting a real job. Uh, it's not exactly an easily transferable skill set. We'll ridicule those in power with funny drawing and biting satire for food. <laughs> sure, I can draw, but my art isn't for everyone. Uh, don't you love the way I painted the, the greedy corporate polluters descending into hell? Yeah, but is it right for the nursery? <laughs> Uh, with newspapers struggling, believing I would find another staff job is like believing in Santa Claus. Today, Santa Claus tryouts, ho, ho, ho. I suppose I could apply to be a greeter at Walmart. Welcome to Walmart, where our goods are made in China and we don't pay a living wage. You're fired. Or a barista at Starbucks. You misspelled my name and you made my nose too big. I said no caricatures. You're fired. 
Or maybe I can take that road trip I never took after college. Welcome to Xenophobia USA. It might give me the insight into why all of this happened. Do you think satire is important in a democracy? Satire, is that like fake news? Or maybe I can go to a mountaintop in search of spiritual guidance. What kind of pen should I use? What now isn't just a question for a recently fired cartoonist. It's a question for every citizen who cares about the soul of America. You mean the soul we sold to Putin? Uh, forces are at war with our democracy, our institutions, and our freedom of the press. It's up to each of us to fight back in our own way to the barricades and the drawing tables. What now? More cartoons. All right. So if, if I did, thank you. If I did have my new book here, this is what it would look like. Uh, and here's, the, here's the, the full cover, the front and the back. And I'll just read you uh, one, one of the quotes. Um, the nice thing about, that I was able to do is there were a lot of people that wrote about what happened to me. And some of them were cartoonists, some of them were journalists. And, uh, and it, was, it was very flattering. And so I used some of them in, in the book as essays in between the chapters of cartoons. Um, but uh, I, I'll just point you to the last one. It says, I blame Hillary. If she had won the election, I would still have a job. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much. And uh, I guess now we're going to do some, uh, some questions. Yeah,